Hello, I'm Coretta Wilson, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Insight with Superintendent Heath Morrison. Our goal? To give you an opportunity to get the latest information about CMS. Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools is a district that has over 140,000 students, more than 150 campuses, and employs nearly 19,000 teachers, support staff, and administrators. But it has only one superintendent, and he is joining us right now to provide some insight on some of the issues and initiatives that are happening right now in CMS. Dr. Morrison, it is very good to see you again. Good to see you. And we have so much to talk about on Get this right edition. At it. We will talk about safe schools. The board, uh, school board recently voted on an action item regarding some school safety, outlining um, some new things that will be coming along, fencing, ID badges, and some cameras. You say this is not a reaction, but being proactive? Well, I think what is important to put out is the most sacred obligation we have in our school district mm -hmm. is to keep our students safe. I'm a parent in CMS myself, and so before I worry about what my child learned in math, social studies, English, I want to make sure that he or she is safe. And so that sacred obligation is something we take very seriously. We're constantly looking at our processes, procedures. We're trying to make sure we've got the right plans in place, mm -hmm. enough security force, and also the facilities are, are an important part of keeping our students and our staff safe. And so obviously after what happened uh, with the horrific event in uh, Connecticut at Sandy Hook Elementary School, we have to go back and look at all of our processes, systems, ask that question that we learn anything that we should be thinking about. And so we had a unique opportunity. Uh, we had some uh, savings from our 2007 bond campaign. Uh, we started a partnership and collaboration with our uh, county commissioners and the county manager to see could we use a portion of those savings to potentially do some facility upgrades uh, at our campuses. What we looked at, and again, uh, my point is not to say that this is a reaction to Sandy Hook, uh, but we looked at a number of things that we think help from a facility standpoint of keeping our students and our staff safe. Uh, so, for example, single point of entry is one a national best practice. Uh, that's something we think is very important. Cameras that will allow us to continue to monitor all of our campuses uh, for safety reasons. And then also strategic use of fencing. Uh, not that a fence is going to keep any intruder mm -hmm. necessarily from coming onto a campus, uh, but I'll, I'll share a story with you. One of my first school visits, uh, I was with a group of teachers who were in a, one of our mobile units. And uh, they had just had the uh, mobile unit uh, broken into. Okay. Uh, several of the items in the classroom were stolen. The teacher was very upset. Um, she related later to me that the students were upset. Uh, and so that type of issue happens too often. So can you put things in place, fences, cameras, single point of entry, that not only keep our schools safer, uh, but send a message to our community about how much we value safety. So I think uh, this is broader than just a reaction to mm -hmm. Sandy Hook. It's an ongoing commitment, again, that is our most sacred obligation. And we have so many campuses to work with, like 150. Right. How do we get to them all, and what, what kind of time frame are we looking at? Well, we have over 159 campuses, and okay. so it, we are a large school district. Right. But I think what's important to remember is, is that this is not a new initiative. We, every school has a safety plan. Every school has a crisis plan. Uh, every school has always tried to be as safe as it could be. Uh, this was a unique opportunity to look at one aspect of school safety facilities and say, could we do more? And thankfully, uh, we have some resources. We have a good partnership with our county commissioners. We thank our board for moving this forward. Uh, hopefully our county commissioners will see fit to move it forward. Mm -hmm. And again, we just did a survey uh, with our public. Over 10,000 people responded to that survey. And th one of the highest priorities of our community, parents, staff, right. students, uh, teachers, was to keep our schools safe. Okay, so just to reiterate, we have fencing that we're looking at, maybe some ID badges, um, cameras that would be in place. And single it, point of entry. Single point of entry, and it looks as if we have the funding to pay for it. Yes. As it goes along. All right, let's talk about money. Yeah. More money and compensation. Uh, pay for performance, the March 1st deadline has passed to put together, um, I think, some information for the state. Yes. What happened with that? Were teachers involved? Is that moving forward? Yeah, so um, the March 1st deadline was part of a piece of legislation that happened in the last legislative session. And, and that legislation said uh, local school districts could submit a pay for performance plan 
Uh, don't have to, but you could. Okay. Uh, and it had to be submitted by March 1st of this year. I met, uh, remember I came on board in July. Right. Uh, in uh, October, I met with a group of teacher leaders, associations, teacher associations, principals, and we talked about should we in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools uh, even attempt to try to create a plan. Okay. The consensus was that we should for this reason. Legislation can quickly go from you can submit a plan to you must have a plan. Okay. So we thought it was important for the voice of our school district, the second largest school district in North Carolina, to be heard. So we created a task force, uh, had over 30 teachers, some administrators mm -hmm. involved. Um, we had uh, a survey that went out to all of our uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. We had several uh, town hall meetings. This group did an amazing job. What we came uh, to consensus was, although great work was done, some really strong guiding principles were created, that we did not want to move forward any plan that we didn't have a chance to vet thoroughly with our executive staff and then okay. go back out to all of our teachers to make sure that they felt a comfort level before we moved it forward. So one of the things that really came out of this workforce that, um, that presented to our Board of Education mm -hmm. recently uh, was that we need to have the voice of our teachers in any plan. This is an important topic, it's huge. Uh, teachers are very interested and concerned. Uh, they want to make sure their voice is heard. And so before we uh, try to come to any sort of artificial deadline, uh, we're going to do it right, we're going to do it well, we're going to make sure the voice of our teachers are heard, and then at the appropriate time we'll have a plan that we will move forward. So where do we go from here? More meetings will pay for performance become a reality. What's the next step in, in moving it forward if it is going to go forward? Well, assuming that at some point soon we don't have uh, legislation that says we have to have this, okay. then what we'll do is uh, we have a group that's been working with our uh, teacher task force that they've been very pleased with called Patel for Kids. Uh, they have uh, sent us the draft of the plan. We want okay. our task force to say, yes, that plan does reflect all of our hard work. Okay. Uh, then we'll take that plan. Uh, we'll work on that plan, we'll give the task force feedback, mm -hmm. uh, we'll get input from all of our teachers, and then this task force will fold into a broader uh, task force, one of our 22 task forces mm -hmm. uh, that are helping support our uh, plan the way forward. And then this task force will look at not only teacher compensation, but administrative and support staff compensation, okay. ultimately culminating in a plan that people have had an opportunity to vet, provide input into, and hopefully mm -hmm. will rally around as the right plan. Last question on that, a deadline. You know, I, again, if, as long as it's within CMS's opportunity to mm -hmm. control, uh, the deadline will be when we have a plan that we feel good about, the teachers have had input in, and again, you're never going to get consensus. If you put out a plan and 75% of our teachers say this is a great plan and 25% <laughs> say no, this is the wrong plan, if you move forward with it, you could say, well, the vast majority of our teachers right. like the plan. There's going to be 25% of our teachers that say we don't like it. So I don't think you can ever say, you know, until everybody's happy with it, but when we have a plan we feel good about, the teachers have a voice in that seems to have a majority of support mm -hmm. of our employees, then that will be the deadline. Okay. We'll table that one and talk more about it. Yes. More money. The budget. Yeah. Where are we with the budget? What are you proposing? Do you have anything in mind and specifically that you're planning to give um, the board at this time? Well, we'll present um, our budget to the board officially in April. Okay. Uh, we have had some conversations with our board, some workshops. Uh, we have put out a survey to our community. Again, almost 11,000 people uh, took part of that survey. We got some great insight. Uh, Can you give us some? Yeah, uh, some of the highest priorities uh, of uh, the people responding to the survey were around security, okay. uh, investing in technology, uh, okay. making sure that we uh, reinforce the professional development needs of our workforce. Okay. So I thought those were three really, really strong, really important priorities. Okay. Obviously, uh, teacher pay came up mm -hmm. uh, where there is a desire to see our teachers get additional compensation. So uh, not that there was anything necessarily surprising, but uh, the fact that there, there was a great deal of consistency on those topics. And so what's happening right now is executive staff is taking all of that information. We're trying to learn what our budget is going to be in terms of the available dollars at the federal, state, local level. Right. Uh, it's just like doing a budget at home. How much money do we have to spend? Okay. What are the things we have to do? And then what's left over at the end for things you might want to do? Okay. And so we're in the process right now trying to figure out what our revenue is going to be from the federal, state, local level, match it up to strategic goals, because ultimately a budget is an indication mm -hmm. of your priorities. And then as we finalize that, we'll present it to the board. We'll have lots of opportunity for community input, okay. uh, and then ask the board to vote uh, positively on it. Okay, and the deadline for the big vote, is that in June or? Um, what will happen is it goes through a series of uh, things. So the board will vote uh, hopefully to move the budget forward. It will okay. go to our county commissioners. It will come back in June for a final vote of our bo uh, board, and then it will become our adopted budget. Okay. Yeah. We'll table that one and talk again. Task force, yeah. you have about 22 that are out there. Um, 
all working hard. Can yeah. you give us an update on any one or two that you want to highlight at this particular time? Well, we had a, a community event recently, not only to update our, our community about our budget, but also to make our 22 task forces available to our community. So okay. uh, if people wanted to come and listen to updates, to give input, to share ideas, uh, they were available and then we'll have several more of those opportunities that those okay. dates and places are available on our website. Uh, I've had an opportunity to meet a lot of people mm -hmm. who are on our task forces and they want to tell me the exciting work. Really these task forces give us an opportunity to do two things. Have some out of the box thinking by our community leaders, right. our uh, partners all across our district and bring ideas to us but also as our executive staff uh, is working with our administrators and, and all sorts of folks mm -hmm. around trying to come up with the ideas that we need to move forward and a revised strategic plan. Uh, the task forces become a sounding board so we can bounce ideas off of our task forces. So as we have a task force on alternative educational programs, okay. how do we stretch the concept of alternative education so it's not how do we address students with uh, discipline or behavioral issues, okay. but really we create true alternative type of programs for kids to match a program with the unique needs of a student. Um, okay. How do we enhance rigor? We have a task force on our gifted students. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that with our most gifted students we're not holding them back but we're constantly accelerating them so the pace of instruction matches their ability to move forward at a faster pace. I'm just fascinated by the great ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm, we're honored to have these people uh, serve on these task forces and it's going to make us a better school district. Okay, we'll look to hear more about the task force as well. Okay, when we come back, connectivity in the classroom. The digital age enters the schoolhouse, ushering in a whole new way of teaching as well as learning. What does that mean for the students across the district? We'll Google some insight on all things tech and CMS. Welcome back to Insight. iPads, Android, Wi-Fi, Twitter. If all of that sounds a little bit foreign to you, well, just find the nearest fourth grader and they will be sure to explain it to you. No problem at all. This generation has been born into a world of technology that affects every aspect of their lives. And now more than ever, their education too. So how does CMS respond to life in the digital age? Joining us to help us answer that question is Dr. Valerie Truesdale, the CMS Chief Information, I want to get this right, Transformation Officer. There you go. Welcome, Dr. Truesdale. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Well, thank you. Um, our first question, what is the number one priority for CMS when it, involves, when it involves technology? The most important thing we have going on right now is trying to ensure that all of our schools have the infrastructure to support technology in the classroom to support digital teaching and learning for all of our learners, whether they be students or teachers. Mm -hmm. What about Wi-Fi? We've seen Wi-Fi going up in a lot of different yeah. schools. I know AG, where I am, has it. How are we coming along with that? You know, we started last summer with none of our schools having enough connectivity to support a classroom full of 30 learners online at the same time. None of our schools. And the superintendent gave us a charge to bring all of our schools into the 21st century to prepare them to have the infrastructure to support not only students in the classroom so that they can access the global village, which is their classroom these days, but also to support North Carolina's mandated online testing, right. which we did not have the capacity to do. So we're now at about 30% of our schools have full wireless access, and our goal is to reach by next fall 100% if we have enough funding to be able to support it and man hours to put it in before next fall. We've got our bandwidth in place okay. and now we're improving our access points. How are we using the technology? Most parents, most people from the community are used to walking into the schoolroom and seeing a desktop, two or three. The teacher mm -hmm. has one and maybe some for students. Uh, we're used to seeing maybe nowadays some laptops. But now we have the different pads and the different tablets. We do. Children are using their telephones um, to read novels. I don't know how they see the small print, but they do. How are we using all of this technology in the classroom, students as well as the teachers? So how, do, how should we be using it? It's a digital age 
for sure. And we are all over the place in CMS. Some of our schools have a great deal of technology and some of our schools are still using overhead projectors. Not even the kind with the transparencies yeah. that you put on, but the ones you crank. Oh boy. It's pretty interesting. I think I've seen one of those under a desk Before somewhere. Yeah. Like right. Yes, there are some schools <laughs> who are using that as their major mode of technology okay. still. So we so got to work on that. We are working on that and it's a it's really a fun time to be in education. We started with Bring Your Own Technology Pilot right. with about 21 schools. And as, as those schools began to embrace technology, it's been fascinating to see how many students are able to bring technology. At one of our schools, Hawkridge, where the superintendent was having his media briefing yesterday, about 70% of third, fourth, and fifth graders are bringing some sort of device every day, which has been pretty interesting. And so what we're trying to do is to help our schools as they get wireless access throughout the school, the principal can turn on the wireless for staff first right. until they get agile and then the students to bring their own device. So currently over 50 schools are using bring your own technology every day. And I think most people think that's a great idea. One of the things I want to ask you about is the digital divide because you mm -hmm. will have those students who mm -hmm. can more than afford a new iPad, um, a laptop right. and, and the Nooks and, and the Kindles and then you have others who cannot. Certainly you don't want this to um, increase the achievement gaps. How do we ensure that everyone is on the same page with digital? Yeah, so as uh, Valerie said, you know, our first task is to get all of our schools to the standard that they need to, to have that kind of connectivity. Uh, then we need to make sure that our teachers have access to the tr sort of technology for inspired teaching right. and learning. Then we have to respect our teachers and give them the professional development that they need because not all teachers are at the same level with right. the technology. Then we start talking about the devices with the students. Now, many of our students are going to feel most comfortable with the technology they can bring into the Correct. classroom themselves. They actually don't want us to provide it. Right. But there are going to be some students who can't, and so we're going to have to find the means and the resolve to get every student the technology that they need. But then there's a broader context of, the technology really opens up the world of the classroom, right. but you have to have... That can be good or bad. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, but you have to be able to access it anywhere, anytime, which means yeah. also at home. You can't have a teacher given a homework assignment that requires an internet search if many of their students can't access the internet. So we started to try to create partnerships. Uh, we've uh, worked uh, to, to reduce the cost for families to be able to actually uh, get internet services. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that right. we're going to have to reach out to our city and county partners so that Charlotte Mecklenburg really is a, is a haven and an example across the country of not allowing there to be a digital divide. Right. One of the things that we've found, I went to some of these Bring Your Own Technology schools to make sure that all the students were included, that no child was left behind in the classroom. And what we find is that teachers have, as you mentioned, two to three devices already in their classroom. Mm -hmm. So they're sharing in small groups and just handing students seamlessly a piece of equipment so that they could begin to work alongside the others and it really right. is working well. I've been very surprised it has exceeded my expectations. Okay, there's a lot going on in technology and it seems to change every day. It does. So don't go too far. <laughs> uh, we'll be inviting so you thank back you. Thank you again so much. sometime soon. Anytime. It's great meeting you and thank, thank you so you. much. Well, we are not done just yet. Stay tuned for more insight from Dr. Morrison on topics that matter to you concerning our schools here in Charlotte Mecklenburg. Topics like sequestration and cultural competency. What does it all mean? How do you say it twice? Find out after the break. And welcome back to the show. This is the part of the program where we get to ask the superintendent what's coming down the road. He gives us a head up on all of the new developments that we should know about. And we're starting today with something called power schools. Mm -hmm. Power schools versus parent assist, I believe. It's actually power school versus NCYs. Versus NCYs. Yeah. And parents should know NCYs is our, the teacher grade book. It's, it's, book. It's, far, it's bigger than that. It's our student information system. Okay. It's how we make sure that we can bring in all of our information, mm -hmm. uh, have the uh, system speak together to uh, allow the school district to do the operational things we have to do. Okay. Of which one feature is the uh, system of power link. Okay. What's going to happen with power schools? Will parents yeah. be able to get grades, see students' yeah. grades, see their attendance, um, talk back and forth to teachers? 
Yeah. What will it be like? So Power School is a conversion happening across the state of North Carolina public education. Okay. Our State Department of Public Instruction is really uh, taking the helm of converting from uh, its current system of NCYs mm -hmm. to Power School. Uh, we are uh, actively working with State Department trying to make sure that we do a good job with that conversion. Uh, converting student information systems is never an easy task, yeah. uh, but we've worked well with our State Department. Uh, we've put a lot of great things in place. We are starting to communicate now to our schools and to our parents about this change, letting them know uh, what's going to be different. And, okay. and I think there's a lot of features that once people become familiar with it, both our teachers, our administrators, and our parents are going to really mm -hmm. like. Uh, but it's like anything else, getting new to a new system is not something yeah. that's not going to come without some challenge. Do you think it'll be parent friendly once it's in place? I think once it's in place, but again, I think, you know, once you're familiar with something, mm -hmm. you know, that you, you like it, and then to have to convert to something different uh, doesn't feel comfortable all the time, but okay. we are going to really do a good job being proactive in our communications. Mm -hmm. uh, we're somewhat dependent on the state to tell us what we can oh, and, and can't uh, put forward at, at the right time, but uh, as soon as the state gives us the information, we're trying to be doing a very diligent job of getting out to our communities, our parents, our teachers, and our administrators. Now, will power schools begin with the 20... 13-14 school year? It will indeed. Uh, we'll make that uh, flip over this summer uh, okay. and, and a lot's going to have to happen because it's how we pull together our bus schedules, we put out our student schedules, it's how teachers access their grade books, it's the parent links, it's all of those things and so the mm -hmm. systems all have to integrate. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of wiggle room for any kind of uh, uh, issues mm -hmm. or challenges so we're going to have to we're gonna have one shot to really work with the state to get it right. Okay, we'll be sure to update parents and teachers on all that's coming Absolutely. there. Uh, cultural competency has been something um, you've been talking about a lot Indeed. in the newspapers and of course on Insight. Yeah. Um, the latest on that topic. Yeah, so we've got a great group that's working on finalizing our, our initial plan. Uh, that plan is going to reflect uh, many different phases. Okay. Uh, it's going to speak to uh, honoring people that have done this great work in the community. It's going to lift up great work that's already been done in our school district, but also bring um, some outside perspectives to the discussion. Okay. Now, ultimately, the goal is to meet every child where they are mm -hmm. and get them to where they need to be to look at differences amongst our students, not as deficits, but as assets. And so uh, it really, at the end of the day, is about helping us do a better job of teaching and learning with all of our mm -hmm. students. So I'm excited. Uh, as soon as we finalize that plan, we will start to communicate that okay. and, and really get to work on it. But it's going to be exciting. You have to communicate it first on Insight. I'll oh. hold you to that one. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Sequestration. Yeah. Big word. Say it yeah, three it times fast and you're like, oh my goodness, yeah. what is that all about and why are we talking about it? Well, as you know, uh, Washington, like we talked about a budget earlier, right. Washington has to come up with a budget. Uh, there's a lot of conversation between uh, Congress and the President, mm -hmm. Congress and Congress, about how they come together on a budget and how do they uh, have a balanced budget. And, and so there's some mandatory cuts that if they can't come to a budget agreement mm. by March 1st, automatic spending cuts go into effect of which okay. education is impacted. We get about 10% of our budget in CMS from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And so what we've been told by the U.S. Department of Education is that these sequestration cuts that we'll learn more about if they happen on uh, uh, March the 1st mm -hmm. uh, may be in the range of somewhere between 5 and 9%. Uh, and so what we have to do is find out, first of all, what's the percentage, mm -hmm. then find out what categories they would impact, and then what are the restrictions in terms of how to address uh, those funding shortfalls. What, is, is that a shortfall for the 2013-14 the yeah, and going forward? Yes, it won't that? impact us this year. It would impact us uh, for the following year. Now, okay. what I feel good about is that uh, knowing that this was a chance, uh, mm -hmm. our Title I office has worked with okay. our Title I schools and, and other departments that receive federal funding, and we've tried to mm -hmm. uh, make sure that we will have some carryover at the end of the year. So some things we would have loved to have done, we've held back, so that if, in fact, we have some of these mm -hmm. cuts, for example, a 5.2% cut, uh, would be over $4 million. That's a lot. Uh, so we're trying to buffer that so that the impact next year will be uh, not as, uh, as harmful as it will be felt in other school districts. So okay. uh, it, it's something we're monitoring very closely. So you're a little bit prepared. We, we, <laughs> you're thinking we, ahead. We always strive to be proactive rather than reactive. Okay. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, lots of good information. We'll be back in a moment. Some final thoughts are on the way. And before we go, we want to give a very special thanks to three outstanding educators who have recently retired from the school district. They are leaving us. Deidre D. Gardner is one of them. Helena Robertson, another. 
as well as Lawrence Mays. We will miss them for sure, and um, I'm sure they're going to enjoy their long holiday breaks and their long spring breaks and summer breaks. Any comments you want to make about those principals who are retiring? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've always thought of leadership as a privilege, it's service. And these three leaders have really served our, our communities, our schools, our students so well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we hate to see them go. Uh, trust me, we try to talk them out of it, but, uh, but, but they are at that point where their next step of their uh, leadership journey is uh, retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, we will continue to have them involved in our school district. And so uh, having uh, to find replacements for these uh, principals <laughs> tough will be- Tough job for you again. <laughs> it, will, it will be a tough job because they've set the bar very high. All right. Well, we congratulate them and um, wish them the very best. Absolutely. And we thank you for joining us again, giving us so much information, so little time and so much to talk about. <laughs> when it comes to getting information about Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, we know you have many options. Our commitment is to you to provide transparency and reliability in keeping you informed about the important work of educating our students. Thank you so much for watching and join us next time for more insight.